I'm at the Museum of Flight to check out the Apollo exhibit and I brought the new Speedmaster. The changes are subtle, but trust me, it's everything that we ask for. Hey guys, I'm Max and welcome back to Hot Ones. So we have an exciting one today and I'll cut to the chase. I bought the new Speedmaster and I'll tell you why. So it's been 25 years since Omega last updated this watch and for good reason. See, they understand that wearing this watch is an emotional experience for people. This was of course the original watch that went to the moon, but even today it's NASA's only approved watch for EVAs or extravehicular activities, AKA the spacewalk. So Omega has this almost impossible task of evolving this iconic timepiece, but without making so many changes that they risk offending the purists. So today I'm gonna to tell you why I spent my money on the new 3861, despite already owning a couple of speedies. And we're also gonna look at all the details that came together to make this a worthy successor to the outgoing 1861. So how do you update arguably the world's most iconic watch? The answer is very carefully. Omega seems to have kept their ear to the ground and they've listened to all of our complaints about the last generation Moonwatch. The first thing they addressed is wearability. You see, 42 millimeters is on the large side even for a modern watch, but how do you keep true to the proportions of the watch that went to the moon, but somehow make it wear smaller? First, they attacked the bracelet. Look here, compared to my 1957 reissue, which has the same case and bracelet as the last generation watch, the new 3861 has center end links that articulate rather than protrude outward. Then they made the link smaller and gave it a vintage inspired taper. This new bracelet is much less intrusive and along with the pinstripes on the buckle, gives it a more dressy and refined feel. On my skinny wrist, there is no longer any unsightly gaps, but by the numbers, things have remained largely the same. The keen-eyed observer will notice that this new watch is a half centimeter thinner. This may not seem like much, but when thicknesses get above 14, every little bit counts. From the side, you can see that this height was saved by thinning out the case back allowing the watch to wear more flat and secure on the wrist, and preventing that wobbliness associated with tall watches. What hasn't changed is the overall recipe for the instrument that kept Apollo 13's crew on track when all of their electronics failed. We still have the matte black triple register dial featuring high contrast white stick hands and an arrow tip chronograph counter, making the watch as legible as any aircraft instrument. The case back commemorates Omega's accomplishments with NASA. Note, the Sapphire version of this watch has a display case back with other subtle differences, such as an applied Omega logo, polished sections on the bracelet, and a $1,000 premium. But for me, if this is your first Speedmaster, go with the one that NASA chose and get the Hesalite. Though you're unlikely to have to worry about shattering the crystal in zero gravity, the vintage distortions more than make up for a bit of scratch resistance. So I think it's interesting what Omega is doing with the movements for their Speedmasters. See, recently they recreated the original 321 movement and they put that in special heritage models like the Ed White as a nod to the past. Whereas they've added this advanced coaxial escapement to the 3861 as a way to prepare it for the future. Now, before we dive into this movement, I'm gonna ask you to do all those YouTube things like giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing if you like the content on this channel. Because unlike Dogecoin, this watch has actually been to the moon. A frequent criticism of the previous 1861 movement was its pedestrian nature. And Omega has really stepped things up here with a free sprung balance and a coaxial escapement. This is of course the invention of George Daniels, 
who in the 1970s reimagined a 200-year-old system of turning mechanical force into a timekeeping mechanism. The joule count goes up from 18 to 26, and these additional contact points allows this escapement to work with less friction and more precision, thus extending service intervals, reliability, and reducing wear. Additionally, there is now a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism, surely useful in the harsh environment of space, as well as impressive finishing at this price point with beveled bridges, countersunk jewels, and Geneva striping. A small nod to the watch's heritage is the inclusion of the dot over 90, which, to true speedy fans, is something akin to Cindy Crawford's mole. What really tickles my fancy is the reintroduction of the stepped dial, which disappeared in the 70s. The minute track is set lower than the center of the dial, with the loom stripes cutting across this transition. Sure to make vintage fans happy, this feature along with deeply sunken subdials gives the watch immense depth when looked at off-axis, and makes this otherwise flat surface three-dimensional. As if all that wasn't enough, this watch now satisfies the stringent METAS certification, which goes beyond COSC and runs within 5 seconds per day. And for the OCD amongst us, the movement finally offers hacking, allowing the second hand to stop for precise time setting. And I can swear the loom has just a hint of yellow compared to the bright white of previous generations, but that may just be hopeful thinking. You get the picture. This doesn't feel like a brusque decision. Rather, I imagine Omega engineers spending long nights debating every little detail, vacillating on things like historical significance and technical specifications. And what a compelling package they have delivered. So I'll tell you why I think Omega really hit this update out of the park. Instead of making any one major change, what they've done is gone through and sort of massaged all the details on this watch. And the result is a moon watch that's more refined. The watch is more wearable, more technically advanced, and more historically accurate. I do wish though that they would have extended the power reserve a little longer. An extra day would make a big difference. But what do you think? Would you upgrade even if you owned the last generation Speedmaster Professional? Let me know in the comments below. So thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.